Awesome. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. We at the USAEL are excited to kick off today's edition of the Careers in Esports webinar series. This is episode six in our recurring series that aims to provide students, educators, and esports enthusiasts with a unique opportunity to explore a multitude of jobs and career pathways in esports. Now, you all should know the deal by now. Every month, we talk to a different expert from the world of esports and gaming. The roster includes professional players, coaches, game developers, tournament organizers, and others to give our listeners firsthand insights and expert advice on pursuing a career in the esports or gaming industries. Our guest list is full of industry veterans stemming from companies and organizations that have established a significant presence in the space, Blizzard Entertainment, Ryan Games, Sony Bend, and Bungie, just to name a few. But as usual, let's start with some introductions. I'm Rich Conti. And I'm Peter Poliglov. And we are your recurring hosts for the Career in Esports series. Rich, I bet you're extra excited to introduce our next guest today. You are absolutely right. Today, we're talking with somebody with whom I have a lot of personal experience. In the days gone, he was a good college buddy. And now in the present, he's overworking at Sony Bend. Hey, wait, didn't they make a game called Days Gone? <laughs> Without further ado, it's my privilege to introduce to our audience, Matt McCutch, a senior technical game designer at Sony Bend. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, some key moments from Matt's career include uh, owning the open world voiceover system for the game Days Gone, um, as well as working on other post-launch content for the game. Uh, so for the audience, Matt, if you could tell us a little bit about um, what working as a senior technical designer is all about. Uh, what makes a technical designer? Uh, the main distinction of a technical designer compared to like other designer archetypes are um, a technical designer technical designer covers more technical aspects as you'd imagine based on the name uh, so while most designers like gameplay designers might be more in like uh, visual scripting or level designers are like in block mesh and like system designers are in excel and like spreadsheet land uh, a technical designer kind of jumps back and forth between scripting and pure coding. Uh, it also kind of depends on what studio you're in, exactly what your responsibilities will be. But specifically at Bend, uh, we will, a uh, technical designer will be going into both visual scripting and code and back and forth and back and forth and facilitating different things for normal, not normal, but for like gameplay and scripting designers so that they can have the tools they need to make their content too. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Matt. And we'll go ahead and actually jump right into our first question. Uh, which is, what role has gaming played in your life? And when did you start gaming? Uh, I've Games uh, have basically always been in my life. Uh, one of my earliest memories is being like in a stroller in a Coles or Sears or something and playing Tetris uh, on a Game Boy while my mom was talking to one of her friends. And the uh, friend was a little surprised to know that there was actually someone in the stroller because I was just so quietly just sitting there. Uh, and I think that my mother even went to say, like, I was a fairly easy child to take care of because if I just had a game, I could be content for whatever it needed to be. Like long car rides, I would be just on like my Game Boy Advance in the back seat. Uh, if I as long as I could just basically be plopped down next to a charger somewhere at someone's house, she wouldn't have to worry about me all day, basically. Uh, and then to go beyond that, like I used games to bond a lot with my brothers because both there's a pretty big age gap between me and uh, my elder brother, which is the middle of three. I think it's like six ish years or something. I should probably know how old my brothers are, but you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I would play games a lot with them, especially because of that age gap. I wasn't like necessarily able to do like sports stuff with them because of like both just I couldn't keep up with them. And also they were a lot bigger than me. So it wasn't necessarily like safe, not to say that my brothers were like mean or anything, but like you can't play tackle football with a 18 year old when you're like 10. So, I mean, you could, but you shouldn't. Uh, and then 
so I, I played games a lot with them that transitioned to playing games with my friends in like middle school and like Xbox 360 days being in Xbox Live parties uh, and just like hanging out after school playing games. And it's, it just kept on going from there. And I just always had something to do with games. I was, yeah, so it's everywhere. So it's safe to say your family supported your passion for gaming. Uh, yeah, for the most part, I would say that uh, my mother especially would just like, she would make sure I didn't like spend all my time playing games. But even when I wasn't playing games, sometimes I was like reading magazines like Nintendo Power back when that was a thing. And so that I would be reading Nintendo Power when I was supposed to be reading or I would be like uh, building like is like a elementary school student. I would like be building like essentially block mesh out of just building blocks and just like making worlds and imagining a game in there and like doodling uh, fake Pokemon and coming up with different game ideas. Uh, I have memories of like in uh, CCD, so like Catholic school on Sundays, uh, I would be just like doodling move sets for Super Smash Brothers during class instead of focusing. So even, yeah, I, she made sure that uh, I didn't only play video games, but didn't care if everything else was centered on gaming, I guess. <laughs> those sound very creative, um, <laughs> those endeavors. Would you say that gaming throughout your childhood brought you any positive skill sets like that creativity or others? Uh, creativity is definitely a huge part of it. Um, and then beyond that, it definitely helped with like more tangible things like problem solving and even hand-eye coordination to an extent. Like I didn't do a ton of sports, but I would say that my hand-eye coordination is still pretty decent for someone who doesn't do like, I did a little bit of basketball and I wasn't good at it, uh, but I still have the hand-eye coordination for it such that like when I got to high school and hadn't been playing sports really, and I got a little bit into like ultimate Frisbee, I could throw a Frisbee and like catch a Frisbee and that was fairly easy. Uh, and then problem solving, especially I played like a lot of not puzzle games. Well, some puzzle games like Tetris, but even just like games that are puzzle adjacent. And so I really like solving puzzles even now and the skill of problem solving as a whole, I use like both at work and just like in my day to day, because life is essentially a series of puzzle uh, problems. And so being able to problem solve because you've dealt with a bunch of very various, various problems is useful. That's awesome. I might have to see your custom Pokemon someday, Matt. They are not good. A lot of them were uh, stolen from other monster-esque things. <laughs> I wonder if that's a designer thing, a game designer thing, too, because I also remember creating custom Pokemon cards uh, mm -hmm. on the bus, and I would trade them with friends as a kid. We would make our own cards and then trade them, but that's pretty cool. And we're going to jump a little bit ahead with our next question so um matt why did you first choose to pursue a degree in game development uh so it's probably pretty obvious that i was interested in game from like the get-go uh but i didn't actually realize people made games for a long time which sounds like a silly thing to say of oh well these things aren't just appearing out of nowhere someone has to make them uh, but when I was in like late elementary school, early middle school, we were visiting uh, some of my family's like more distant cousins. And I was talking, my mom was like, oh, you should talk to your cousin, uh, Paul, because he is going to school to make games and you really like games. And I was like, he's going to school for what? Uh, and so I realized that like someone could make, uh, someone makes games and that's like a job one person could have uh, or a, a career path rather. And that's when I was like, oh, I, this is like, makes perfect sense for what I want to do. Uh, especially cause like I had already wanted, like I already knew that I liked entertaining people from a pretty young age. And so games are kind of just, games are a form of entertainment a lot of the time. Uh, and so that as like my entertainment career path is made, just made so much sense. Uh, and then beyond that, like it was a matter of figuring out what I wanted like how, how to achieve that goal basically. And that's when I started looking into like, how do I become a game designer is that early. To that end, how did you find the support? Um, like knowing that you wanted to be a game designer at such an early age, 
were there opportunities for you to you know learn about that did you have to seek those out yourself um were there classes at school that were available to you or what what was that support like since you had that goal in mind uh there wasn't a ton of support where i in, in like my school district when i was growing up the most direct thing that i had available to me was there was like a summer school like two or three week long class you could take that was um game development focused and it was like level design and a little bit of scripting and i think it was like i want to say it was in like radian or something the um old call of duty engine i think that they don't use it anymore it was either in that or like a really early version of like source or hammer rather something like a bsp centric sort of thing uh that was me talking to Richie, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and that's like all I had. I had like three weeks of that and I had to take it with another one. So I was like a uh, filmmaking, I don't know, because none of the, nothing else interested me but the one game development one. Uh, and then from there, like I had an understanding, like, okay, well, video games are programming centric, so I should learn about programming. Uh, and it wasn't until like later in high school that I started getting slots in my schedule that I could do whatever I wanted. And so some of the electives I took were like, I took a uh, visual basic and HTML course, which is technically like kind of scripting. Uh, and then I also took a robotics course and both of those were one semester long. And the robotics course was like with, um, it was kind of like a sort of C language ish. So that was like more a programming sort of situation uh, and also problem solving because <laughs> I have to figure out how to make the robot do what you need to do. Uh, and then beyond that, I was just kind of, there was no real other way except for like looking things up myself. So like I started learning about game engines on my own time. I wasn't necessarily like noodling with them because I didn't have a computer of my own until college. But I started just like learning about what it takes to make a game uh, just from reading like interviews and just like reading Wikipedia pages for various games and realizing like, oh, this game and this game use the same engine, but they're different. And this is why. So, yeah, there wasn't really a lot of uh, good education opportunities until I reached college. And then in college, I went to uh, school specifically for game design. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense, uh, unfortunately, and hopefully, you know, things are changing and we're able to provide more support for students that, um, you know, want to pursue this uh, at earlier and earlier ages. I'm also kind of curious, Matt, um, what made you choose game design as the sort of career focus as opposed to something like programming um, because you know in your current role you landed in a space that is like design merged with programming and if i can recall you know in college you were a very strong programmer so what was the decision making like like determining between a game design degree or a game programming degree i think the main determining factor for that is kind of at the end of the day who the call goes to like if you're working on a feature like if it's you as a game designer and a game programmer working together at the end of the day the game designer kind of has the final call for how it feels for the player and i really like the side of like what i want and what i'm trying to do is felt by the player so that's why like design is where i lean more towards is because that is like the what you feel on the stick is generally from a designer like an engineer is pivotal in that feeling and they certainly have input onto that situation uh like into how it feels and like the nitty-gritty of how it works especially but the overall intent is design intent which is from a designer so that's kind of why i gravitated more towards design is because i wanted to be able to at the end of the day, focus on what the player is feeling and doing in any given moment. The creative control, maybe. Yeah. It's not like control in a tyrannical sense. It's just like the direction and how it feels is guided by the designer. Absolutely. Yeah. 
That makes sense. Thank you. And kind of leading that into uh, the next question here, um, in your time working at Sony Bend, how, how has it been? Um, and how does it compare to sort of some of the work that we've done in college? It is both fairly similar and fairly different uh, in like my immediate people that I'm working with on a, like a given, a, fe a given feature, it feels pretty similar to uh, college where it's just like a pretty small group of multidisciplinary people all working together for a common goal. Uh, there is some difference in that, like, because the game is so much bigger, like you have so many people involved in the project, you don't necessarily know everything that's happening all the time. And so sometimes you are like testing your changes or just like playing through the game some, and you're like, Oh, when did that happen? That's new. Oh, that's cool. And it's just kind of, really exciting sometimes, especially when you're in a full swing production for how quickly things can change. Uh, and just like the game is, any given project is constantly improving and getting better in ways that you can't even necessarily imagine because of your smaller scope in your work. Uh, but then with the people you're working with, there is a little bit of difference in that, like sometimes resources are spread a bit wider. So like in college, like we had, xyz artists assigned to a project and that was those three artists you can go for them for anything and you generally knew what their workload was because like for my example on my senior team i was the one assigning the work to the artists so i knew what the artists were doing and so i could kind of gauge if they could do more work uh it's a little bit more difficult in uh AAA because you may have a request for from an artist but that artist could also be getting requests from like this person and this person, and this person, and they have to prioritize their work based on the needs of the entire project. And so you could put a request in and not get it necessarily uh, for, for further than you expect. And that's not like specifically with art, just my example, like any given department, you could request something of, and it might take a bit for it to be sort of not um, to be acted on and for you to get what you need from the request. Um, a interesting other thing that AAA feels like, and this is not like, is mom, um, I was in theater in high school and it feels a lot like that because theater is slightly segmented where you have like, you have people who are doing sets, you have people who are like in the pit, you have, uh, the technical crew, which is like lights and sounds and you have the uh, people on stage and like you have backstage management and they're all disparate people and you don't necessarily know what everyone's working on. But then it all comes together at the end to make a final product. And it's also entertainment, interestingly enough. <laughs> that's a that's a great comparison. Um, and I guess just, you know, in terms of advice for any students that are looking to follow in your footsteps and work as a game designer in a AAA studio, hopefully someday, do you have any advice on like how to get your foot in the door, any particular tips or tricks for like interviews or resumes or just kind of any advice to get them, get them started? My two main pieces of advice uh, would probably be the first one is networking is unfortunately fairly important uh, because it's partly like you need to be able to, everyone wants to like, make games and like work in games, not everyone, but like that's kind of a stigma to an extent. People aren't necessarily able to deal with the fact that like some people who say, oh, I want to be a game designer is just like thinking about it like high level, like, oh, I just want to like play video games for a living. That sounds fun. Uh, and not understand like the amount of work that goes into it because there is a lot of work that goes into game development. Um, so networking helps you kind of break through that wall of like, does this person actually know what it takes? Uh, and then beyond that, uh, your portfolio is actually pretty important, even as a designer. Uh, so portfolios are generally talked about for like artists to show sort of, like this is the sort of stuff I can make. But it's equally, maybe even slightly more important to have a very varied uh, portfolio as a designer to show off your skill set of like what sorts of experiences you can make. Uh, and then a big piece of advice that I give for anyone who's making a portfolio is even if you uh, are just like copying something from another game. If you can mimic a feel of a game and like take it and break it apart and put it back together in your own environment, that's pretty important. Um, one of the ways that I managed to um, get working, get work at uh, Ben Studio is I had 
a uh, copycat project in college where I essentially re took apart certain characters in Overwatch and rebuilt them in Unity. Uh, and then I went on to extrapolate and create my own characters and like sort of mimicking what the design of heroes in Overwatch were and then making my own to try and um, just have a portfolio piece basically. So in that case, like I was pretty unabashedly copying how Overwatch works, but I didn't care because I wanted to work in their tool set and see what it felt like to make something that was kind of in that vein. And it almost sounds like a combination of hard and soft skills that are kind yeah. of necessary for success. For sure. Awesome. Uh, in that case, we'll jump right into our next question. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the day to day as a senior technical engineer? I know we talked about it a little bit earlier, um, but what are kind of some of the some of the work that falls on your plate? Um, it's not necessarily. Uh, it, it's a kind of a fifty fifty of normal tasks that like are already assigned to me when I enter and also just dealing with like emergent issues. So um, for example, like I might come in on days gone to be like, okay, uh, I'm going to spend like the first half of my day working on my post-launch stuff that I was working on, uh, which was a bike race sort of thing. And while I'm working on that, I might get pinged by my lead to be like hey matt this issue has come up with like the open world vo system and we want it for xyz patch so you need to like can you start working on that uh and i'd be like okay and i would switch over to working on that and then uh maybe later on someone would be like okay well actually this other issue has come up and we need someone to help like diagnose the issue and figure out a solution. And because engineers are already pretty strapped working on like a bunch of harder issues that people already know about and are like working on solves, uh, investigation would be led by technical design. And so technical design, uh, Matt, your like your issue that you're working on isn't as high priority as this. So this issue has come up, you need to figure out what's going on and then either solve it or hand it off to someone who can solve it. So like if it's too low, lo too low level, in the code, like if it's like even like save data or like garbage collection or something like that, I that's not necessarily my jurisdiction. So I would hand it off to an engineer who's in charge of that sort of thing, but I would get as much information as I could. I would get like, uh, it's not, it, it's like the, the issue comes from QA, QA gives you a repo, repro, then you go and repro it and figure out like, okay, where exactly is this breaking in the code base? And then if it's something you could solve, you solve it, otherwise you hand it off to an engineer. And then hopefully it gets solved. And if you kind of have to help make sure that the wheels are still turning on that, if it takes too long. So it's kind of a combination of working on like going into a day. I know what I'm intending on working on, but it's only like 75% of my capacity for the day. And the other 25% is like helping with issues or if like a, like a scripting designer isn't entirely sure how to do something, working with them to get them to deal with it and helping to even like educate design so that you don't need to help design with everything that's technical and sort of like running. Sometimes I, we would run workshops to like educate and teach concepts to design. And if you're helping a designer with an, a, a technical task, you would not just give them the answer. You would try and like teach them the answer, which is kind of like when I was tutoring in college, that's what I would want to do is I wouldn't just give people the answers for how to do what they're trying to do in unity. I would try to teach them the fundamentals and the principles for how to solve it and then help them reach the solution themselves. Even if I already knew it. Looks like you're muted there, Peter. Sorry. I was going to, I was going to follow up and ask us, especially about that technical aspect in your work and what the difference between like a technical designer and just a regular game designer is. Yeah. The uh, fastest answer for that is that a technical designer is more likely to be comfortable in code and lower level, lower level sections of like programming languages. Uh, so I know how to like write C and C plus plus and all that stuff. Uh, and then also know how to work in the same tool set as what design works in. Uh, 
excuse me. Uh, and so that's kind of the main difference is that I'm much more able to interweave back and forth. And then as a result, that means that technical designers can have a little bit more complete ownership over systems. So for example, the open world VO system on Days Gone uh, was basically entirely run by a tech desi- technical designer who came, uh, who was in the studio before me. Uh, and then he left the studio like a week or two after I joined the studio. And so like he we quickly transferred the system over to me. Uh, and that system was both uh, in editor and in code and it went back and forth and any like any non-technical designer probably would be a little bit confused with how the system worked and not necessarily know how to improve it or like work on the code side of it. So that's where, uh, that's where a technical designer is needed is because like certain level, certain things that we were trying to do with the system could only be done in code because not everything is exposed outside of code. So kind of, being able to jump back and forth is the key to it. And then because it wasn't necessarily a super complicated system, it doesn't need engineering support. And that's why a single technical designer could kind of create and maintain a a system that was pretty utilized in the game. That that makes sense. That makes sense. Rich, did you have any follow-up questions for Matt? Sure. Yeah. Matt, I wanted to ask, what would you say is your favorite thing that you've worked on and why was it your favorite? Uh, the favorite thing that I've worked on that I can talk about would be uh, the post-launch content that I made for Days Gone, which is a bike challenge that I believe is called Hogwild, uh, where the principle of it is it's a bike race. It's just like a point to point, go here, 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 uh, except the twist to it is that you need to be holding down throttle all the way the entire time if you release the throttle at all your timer starts going down and the race like real time takes like two or three minutes but the timer on the top left only says 20 seconds so if you're not slamming on the gas as much as you can then you won't make it to the end of the race uh and that was a lot of iteration um there were a bunch of different versions of it that we tried i got to do some really interesting and this is going to sound silly, some interesting math to try and solve some problems uh, that we had before we finally settled on the iteration that we shipped with. Uh, And it was just also fun to like create the race in the world that already existed. Uh, I got to work with some technical artists to help make some assets for like, uh, like berms that you could turn with and a bunch of other things like that. So it was just a very interesting and fun piece of content to work on. And I got to work pretty closely with like my manager, my um, the design uh, lead who was like in charge of all the content. I got to work with other departments for like what the assets look like and requesting assets from them and all that. And then at the end of the day, uh, it was a pretty well received challenge from what I could see and people enjoyed it and they didn't think it was too hard, which is kind of what my goal was. My goal was to make something that was fun, not necessarily super hard. Uh, and I believe I succeeded on that. And it was a lot of fun reading people's responses to that piece of content. That sounds so awesome. I was going to ask, it's like such a neat concept. Did you go in already knowing the exact type of mini game that you wanted to put into the game? Or was it just like, hey, I want to create a mini game where I want to create a challenge. And it's like, I've got this blank canvas and I can do whatever I want with it. Um, it was not a full blank canvas. Uh, there were some restrictions that were like kind of, I'll say softly given where like, if you could make a good enough reasoning for why you should do this thing that goes outside the restrictions, then, uh, leadership would have let me, but I stayed inside the box that they, uh, gave me. And I had to, I think that I would imagine what we shipped with was probably like the sixth or seventh version that I worked on. Uh, and some of those versions were like pretty drastically different. Um, I think that the only other version that was close to the version I made was like the second version. And then we kind of like came back to it near the end uh, because we found a new solution to a pretty big concern that uh, some of design leadership had. So yeah, the it was pretty just kind of throwing stuff that I thought would be interesting and that generally speaking, like all the versions that I made were interesting in some capacity, but settling or landing on the version we did because it kind of was 
the perfect version that we could come up with that didn't have that many drawbacks as opposed to other versions that like, while they were still fun, usually had like one or two issue that was a little bit too unknown to commit to. Would you say that ability to kind of like take criticism and feedback and go back to the drawing board and iterate and submit it for review is an important skill to have in the industry? Absolutely. You generally speaking, the main thing you need to understand when you're in the industry is that probably and almost always, no one actually thinks that like you're bad or your skills are bad. If they're telling you critique, they're trying to make the best game they can. Everyone who's working in AAA wants to make the best game they can. And they want to try and just make something that is good and people will like and is entertaining and is pretty and all that stuff. So no one is generally being like vindictive when they're giving you critique. They're trying to improve the game, improve your craft as well, because a studio that doesn't want to improve, like people generally want other people to improve, to make the best thing they can. So that it's just always like getting better and better. Uh, and so being able to take critique is super important and especially not taking things to heart. And so being able to just like say, okay, yeah, this is bad because this needs to like, this needs to change because X, Y, Z, that makes sense. Not saying, not, having it be a situation of like, oh, this person saying it needs to be improved because they just don't like what I've made because they don't like me. Like, no, there's usually basically always a reason for critique being given. And then beyond that, sometimes you have to like read a bit deeper of like, okay, this person doesn't like this, but is it because of why they're saying they don't like it? Or is, is their reasoning what they're saying, or is it actually something else that's underlying it? And then the one caveat I want to give is sometimes it's important to stick to your guns depending on like the situation, but generally you need to trust that your other developers aren't trying to just like make things worse for you. And they're trying to improve things. So critique being able to take critique is super important. And it just goes back to those soft skills that we talked about. (laughs) Sorry for cutting you off, Richie. No, no. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And some great, great insights. And actually, um, our next question is, uh, what should students focus on to pursue a career in game development? And this might be a little bit of a circle back to some stuff that we were talking about before in terms of, you know, getting your foot in the door. Um, You mentioned networking, building portfolios. Um, So you could touch on that uh, again a little bit. But I'm also curious kind of your thoughts on um, engines or what a type of coding language students might want to focus on um, if you have any recommendations in that sense as well. Okay. Uh, this is a Throwback. big question. <laughs> it's oh. also a big question. Oh, yeah, the picture, yeah. The picture. <laughs> I was wondering if you'd catch that one. No, yeah, I was like, hmm, that's a very familiar center table, and then hmm, that's a very familiar atrium out the window. <laughs> uh, so I this is going to be a very interesting response specifically for game design is I don't think that there's like one specific thing. That's the key. It's kind of being able to work in multiple facets and improve in in a bunch of different ways uh, all at once. If you want to be a technical designer like me or like even a more scripting centric designer, then you should probably learn C++, C sharp, like a C based language. Uh, But more important than learning a specific language is learning like any language is a good start. Um, messing around with either like Unity or uh, Unreal Engine are both good options because they're pretty accessible at this point. As time goes on, there's more and more tutorials being made, and there's plenty of different like tutorial sets that you can watch online to try and make stuff. Um, another thing that you should really focus on that I think is important both for portfolio work and just like learning as a starting point. It's kind of knowing your own bounds and not necessarily staying within them, but don't dream too big. Uh, I know a lot of people who have like gone a little bit off the deep end trying to make a huge, massive project for their portfolio or just for fun. And they get burned out super early because it takes so long for things to get off the ground. Like if there's a difference between like someone's first game being a super impressive RPG with hundreds of hours or being like a simple platformer where you make two jumps and that's the end of the game. I would probably advise a starter to do the simple platformer because even though it's not like as amazing and cool, it's something. And like, you've made a game that goes end to end 
And from there, you can start adding like, okay, now we add coins, so there's score. And then maybe piece by piece, you keep working on this thing and you'll make something that's super impressive and cool. Or maybe you'll get bored with it and you'll move on to another project. So I think kind of just keeping at what you're trying to do and not dreaming too crazy when you're making your projects and just always seeking to improve yourself and the products that like your craft is kind of the real main goal um, for specifically like triple a learning soft skills, like people skills, how to talk to people, how to take critique, how to receive critique or how to give receive, yeah, how to give critique, how to receive critique, uh, working with other people, how to ask of things of other people, like asking for assets from art or audio or what have you. So soft skills of working in a team are super good and no matter where you get them from. So even like a non-development centric, like cooperative experience is good. So just kind of working on yourself and working on working with others are the two main broad things that might even extend outside of game development, just life as a whole. But I think that those apply pretty well to game development. And kind of a philosophical question from my end for you, Matt, is there anything you would have done differently or kind of changed in terms of your pathway in the industry? Sorry. <laughs> um, a really minor one that I thought of right away is that I should have uh, started doing theater earlier. Uh, I waited two years to go into theater in high school. So I only did four shows because we did uh, some uh, two shows a year in my high school. Uh, and it's funny because I was getting like teased by theater kids in my first few years of high school that I should be joining the theater group because both my elder brothers, uh, both my older brothers were in theater and my last name was known for being in theater. And so I would get teased by like the person who ran the theater group and other people who had worked with my brothers in theater before, like when are you joining? And I should have just listened to them instead of being, being stubborn. So I could have gotten more teamwork experience. Uh, and then the other thing that's a little bit more game development centric <laughs> uh, is I wish I spent more time and this is going to sound a little silly, breaking down and copying other games in college. So like I waited until basically my last year to decide to do that fun side project of the Overwatch thing. But learning how other games tick and trying to recreate them is kind of the perfect exercise for a technical designer, in my opinion, because it's both the technical aspect of like, okay, I need to make this thing work. And then to the design aspect of, okay, and I need to make it feel like that. Uh, so both of those in conjunction make kind of a perfect sort of project when you don't have anything in specific that you want to make. Uh, and just overall, I think I should have done more side projects. I only really did like two in all of college, but I did, I didn't like not do anything at least though. I was working on my senior project a ton uh, in my senior year and my junior year project as well. So, but more, more solo projects probably would have been what I would have changed. That's great advice. Um, Richard, do you have any follow-up questions? Uh, no, but maybe we can head on over to our last question of the day. Yeah, so Matt, kind of, you know, reflecting on everything that we, we talked about today, why do you think schools today, you know, K-12 and beyond, should support their students' love uh, for gaming? I think that essentially gaming is just here to stay, like maybe arguably earlier in like the late 19, in like the nineties and eighties, you could have argued, oh, well, gaming's not like a huge thing and there's no real reason, like no benefits behind it. But I think that because of like the problem solving skills and independent thinking that gaming can cause, uh, as well as just like teamwork in cooperative things and, all of that are all positive attributes to kind of try and what's the word I want to say garner, but like in trying to encourage those like critical thinking skills, problem solving and teamwork in kids are pretty important and games are a pretty, I guess, I guess risk-free way of encouraging all of that. Cause like, you know, it's not, 
that difficult to like solve a puzzle, especially since games as a whole are pretty widespread and further than anyone else would consider. Like it, this might be a little dated at this point, but like Wordle is technically a video game, but I'm sure people don't understand, like don't consider Wordle a video game, but that's just like a word semantic sort of critical thinking game. And so games are both, or games are more in more places than people realize and have a lot of benefits in my opinion. Uh, granted, I don't know like research wise if they do or don't, but I definitely can attribute a lot of my critical thinking and problem solving to my love for gaming and all the time I spent like thinking of solutions for puzzles and games that I've played or like build crafting and RPGs and understanding how things fit together in like a more broad sense is pretty important. And I've used those skills in my day to day outside of like my work and my hobby of gaming. Like, yeah. Uh, if I can ask Matt, how might you suggest schools uh, support their students' love of gaming? I'm not so sure about that one. <laughs> That's a very tricky question. Um, I know in like my high school, we had a video game club, basically, that was just like people getting together and playing Smash or like sitting and playing Minecraft or um, I think we played original Quake. We had like Quake on thumb drives that we would, excuse me, plug into the computers and then do a LAN party of Quake. Uh, and a lot of the newer people had never touched Quake in their life. And a lot of the older people had been going to this club every week for the past three years playing Quake. So there's a pretty big skill gap. But just like having situations where games are at least allowed, potentially even encouraged in like a club or something. Uh, or like getting into more competitive side of things too. Cause like my time on the overwatch team in college with Richie was very interesting and wasn't actually too dissimilar to like working in a team that I was getting in like my projects at the same time. So being able to deal with like, okay, we're a team working towards common goal and we all want to do the best that we can is very similar to making a game where you're on a team making a game, trying to make things the best you can. And like in an esports team, if your coach is trying to help you improve and telling you what you're doing wrong, they're not doing it because they like don't like you. They're doing it because they want you to be the best you you can be. Same thing happens in game development where your managers, if they're giving you critique, aren't doing it because they don't like you. They're doing it because they want you to be the best you, you can be. So that sort of being able to take critique comes from esports, uh, which is very useful. So maybe garnering more esports at like the school level instead of just staying on the collegiate level might be useful. Uh, but just overall not discouraging gaming as like either a hobby or career choice even is probably the best start. Yeah. Providing some sort of structure for the students. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, it was the same in my high school. Uh, we would sneak in halo combat evolved on our flash drives um <laughs> so that's awesome we um, even I, had that uh, in elementary school we had these i don't remember how but we had these old school macintosh devices back when they looked like rounded eggs <laughs> mm -hmm. and it was just the monitor was the whole computer and we had i remember halo death death match i don't even remember which one it was but when the teacher wasn't when we weren't doing our typing class we were we were playing halo <laughs> death match the good old days um, but as I think Richie was about to say, unfortunately, I do think uh, we are out of time here today. So we want to thank uh, everybody for kind of watching this. Matt, obviously a huge thank you to you for both being our panelists today and sharing your experience uh, with our students and educators. I know they will appreciate it. Absolutely. So unfortunately, that means that we are about to conclude our session for today. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Stay safe and happy gaming.